So Tara and I arrived back from Hong Kong just 12 days ago, and we've been away for the last three and a half months in Hong Kong with St. Stephen's, uh, Jackie Pullinger's organization there. And we've had the most extraordinary and wonderful time there as a family. But we've come back into the UK uh, very clearly in a time of crisis. We're experiencing a health crisis, very obviously, with uh, this global pandemic. But with that health crisis um, is also other crises. There's a crisis of, of mental health, a crisis of education. We're facing an economic crisis. And then on top of that, just before we came back, there was the horrific murder of George Floyd. And with that, this outpouring of pain and anger, racial injustice around the world. And a sense as if there's a, a movement for radical change around the world, as if the world is waking up to the reality of racial injustice in a new way. And we're facing then a crisis in terms of our culture. But it's more than just a cultural crisis. One of the books that I found most helpful on this subject and that was given to me by one of uh, a member of our congregation is A Blind Spot, The Hidden Biases of Good People. And in that book, it describes so helpfully how these issues of prejudice, including racism, are not just a problem of a few individuals or a few institutions, but go so deeply into every human heart. And so what we're faced here when we look at racial injustice is a moral crisis that each of us are facing. And as I watched that video of the terrible murder of George Floyd, there is this whole mixture of emotions, of pain and anger, sadness, horror, but also shame, a recognition that this is something that infects my heart and infects all hearts. And so we're facing a moral crisis. And so as we are faced with these crises, what better time than to be thinking and talking about character? And we've been doing this series called Character in a Crisis. And today we're going to be looking at self-control. This country has gone through a massive collective exercise of self-control. We have gone into lockdown and, and a massive exercise of self-restraint. And then um, also social distancing, keeping away from one another. And it seems that some people have then, on top of that act of self-control and self-restraint, have then been working out and doing DIY, whereas others, I suppose, have been doing things uh, which have maybe resembled a loss of self-control, eating and drinking and watching Netflix to get through the whole exercise. But actually, also on top of that, when we look at the Black Lives Matter movement, the thing that struck me has been the exercise of self-control by so many people of color. When you look at all the abuse, all the hatred, all the injustice, going back so long and so deep. The thing that I found so moving and inspiring has been the amount of self-control. This has been one of the most powerful things in the lives of those who fought against racial injustice in the past. When you think of Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, it's been that incredibly powerful combination of anger and courage but also self-control. And in Galatians chapter 5, and Paul lists these fruit of the Spirit. And the last of the fruit of the Spirit, he lists as self-control. And this virtue was something that was well known at the time that Paul was writing. In the ancient world, self-control was very much admired. In fact, in the list of virtues at the time, it was very often the first thing that was listed because it was seen as one of the most important virtues you could have. It's that virtue of going for a run every morning, even when it's raining. It's uh, those people who are able not to eat any sugar or fat or dairy or meat or, or food 
Uh, it's those people who uh, go, are able to go for a swim in Brighton in the winter or actually even in the summer. It's that virtue of self-control. And uh, this is something that I don't feel I have a lot of. I recognized a couple of years ago that I was eating far too much chocolate and exercised almost no self-control when it came to chocolate. So what I decided I was going to do was I was going to eat just two bars of a chocolate bar each day after dinner and lunch and breakfast. And, but I was just going to have two bars, and that, that was it. But I very quickly discovered that chocolate bars vary in how big these little sections can be. In fact, some chocolate bars have no sections at all. So two king-size Mars bars qualify uh, for me quite, quite happily. So um, I've sort of worked out ways around that particular discipline. Although there are times, I have to confess, when I'm filled with sadness and disappointment when I open up the cupboard and discover that all we have is a bag of chocolate raisins, or sometimes even worse, just some chocolate sprinkles, and I'm only allowed two of them. But self-control is not just about self-discipline and self-restraint. For Paul, self-control is about loving one another. And that's why it's at the end of the list and not at the beginning. It's the virtue that allows all the others to happen. It's keeping a secret for someone because you love them. It's exercising the ability to resist sexual temptation for the sake of your marriage partner. It's being able to do the right thing even when you don't feel like doing it. And it's not just about resisting bad things. It's also about positive actions as well. Archie spoke a couple of weeks ago about the parable of the Good Samaritan. I've been thinking about that recently too when thinking about self-control. Because as Jesus tells this story, he describes a man, a Jewish man who is the victim of injustice, lying on the side of the road. And the Levite and the priest, they walk past. Why do they walk past? Well, there could be any number of explanations, but one thing is I wonder is whether they didn't know what to do or didn't know what to say, whether they'd end up saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing and making the situation worse. And so they pass on by. But the Good Samaritan, I imagine he didn't know what to say either or didn't know what he was going to do. But he exercised self-control and decided he was going to move towards this man who was of a different race in order to help him. It was an exercise of self-control, moving away from comfort into discomfort, away from complacency and into action. And that seems to be what is needed at this time where a light has been shone on racial injustice around the world. It needs an act of self-restraint but also self-control in terms of the courage to speak up and the courage to act. Self-control, it's about love. And we need this, this virtue of self-control because there is something wrong with our desires. As human beings, we are filled with all kinds of desires and feelings and emotions. And some of them are good, but some of them are not good. And we have these desires where we desire too much of something, too much of uh, chocolate or sugar or energy uh, from the planet, and it's clearly not good. Or we desire things too quickly at the wrong time. We desire things that actually properly belong to other people. Or our desires get mixed up and are in the wrong order. And when we're confronted with these different desires and complicated desires, desires that are both a mixture of good and evil. We have two natural tendencies. One is repression. We decide we don't like the desires or the emotions that we feel, and so we repress them, we push them down and try to pretend they're not there. Or alternatively, we give in to our desires. We think, okay, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to, if I want to eat chocolate, I'm going to eat chocolate. If I want to shout abuse at someone, I'm going to shout abuse at someone. If I don't want to help someone, I'm not going to help them. 
but neither of these are self-control. I think this was uh, beautifully illustrated in the film, the Disney film, Frozen. And if you haven't seen Frozen, I'm really, really sorry, uh, because I am, well, first of all, um, why not? Because it is brilliant. Uh, but second of all, I, I am really sorry, because I'm going to uh, ruin that film for you. But you've had at least five years to watch it, so it's maybe your own fault. So uh, in Frozen, you have these two main characters, uh, Elsa and Anna, or Anna, as she seems to be called. And Elsa has all these magical powers where she can turn uh, things into snow and ice. And there's this huge amount of power and creativity there. But at a young age, she damages, she hurts her sisters, her sister with her power. And so she decides that she needs to repress this desire, repress these emotions, repress this power. And she, so she says uh, to herself, and sometimes sings, uh, conceal, don't feel, and don't let it show. And it's repression, and it means that she's not free. But then she has this moment of, uh, where she realizes she cannot do this anymore. And she decides that actually she's going to do exactly what she wants to do. And she sings, uh, how could we forget, uh, let it go. And she sings about this new kind of freedom where she's going to do whatever she wants to do. And she sings about there being no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. And you get this release of creativity and power. But at the same time, it means her having to go off by herself. And just as before she'd shut away her sister who loved her so much, actually, when she releases all this power, she shuts her sister away as well. Actually, the song ends with her closing the door of her castle and being totally alone. Because doing whatever you want to do is only possible if other people aren't around. The desire to do whatever you want is really the desire to be alone. And it's not self-control, and it's not true freedom. The way that Elsa is set free ultimately and this is where I'm going to ruin the film for anyone who hasn't seen it, is when Anna goes, has this choice of whether she's going to save her own life or whether she is going to try to save Elsa's life. And Anna chooses to give up her life and lay down her life for her sister. And it's that act of self-sacrificial love that sets Elsa free. And Elsa, having experienced that love, realizes there's a new way to live, which is neither repression nor indulgence, but is self-control, which is living in love. And it comes from this act of self-sacrificial love. This is the message of Christianity. Christianity is not about repression of our emotions or our desires. You only have to read the Psalms to see that. But nor is it about doing whatever we want and just following our desires. It's about freedom and the freedom to be self-controlled. And this is what Jesus has won for us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus exercised his self-control. He prayed to his Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He didn't want to die and he was honest with his Father about his desires but he chose the cross anyway. And then on the cross, and in the process leading up to the cross, was a series of acts of self-control. He was arrested and did not resist. He was mocked and did not speak back. He was beaten and did not fight back. And it was that act of self-control that won the salvation of the world, and also won for us the ability to be self-controlled too. For self-control is really about freedom. The whole of the book of Galatians, and particularly chapter 5, is about the freedom that Christ has won for us. We can be free. We don't need to be ruled by our desires. We don't need to be ruled by other people's expectations. We can live in step with the Spirit, which is perfect, perfect freedom. And this is the message of Christianity. We can be self-controlled because we have been set free. As I mentioned at the beginning, Tara and I have just come back from Hong Kong. And we were living there with 
in a community of about 150 people. Uh, and about 100 of them were there because they were recovering from some kind of addiction, often heroin, but also alcohol, and also addictions involving sex and anger. And these people, these brothers and sisters in this community, up in the hills in the New Territory of Hong Kong, had come there because they had met Jesus Christ and experienced his love, and he was beginning to set them free. And the way that they were finding freedom from these addictions was not through lessons in self-discipline or self-restraint, but in a revelation of Jesus' love for them and, ex and the experience of the Holy Spirit working within them. This is, that was how they were changed. It didn't mean that the change was automatic or immediate, but it was real. And the same is true of us. And Jesus Christ died for you and for me. And that act of love sets us free. The Holy Spirit working within us sets us free. The change might not be automatic or immediate, but it is real. It doesn't mean that there aren't battles and struggles and the need for us to make decisions, but it means that we can fight these battles and it means that we can win these battles. This is what the Holy Spirit can do for us. He can give us self-control. He can set us free. And if the Son sets us free, then we will be free indeed. Shall we pray? And let's, as we're uh, sitting, wherever we're sitting, in uh, sitting rooms with, uh, with friends, with family, and let's open up our hands and invite the Holy Spirit who sets us free to, uh, to fill us. So why don't we just open up our hands and allow the Spirit to come close. And come create a Spirit. The Spirit of God who is not limited by time or place. We pray that you would fill our hearts that you would inspire our minds. And you would set us free. I have an image of uh, someone and it's like there are these, um, these cords around you that are becoming tighter and tighter and more and more restricted and a sense of, of God with these, with these scissors, as so gently, as so precisely, just beginning to cut cord after cord. And it's, uh, it's a very gradual process, but it's a process by which bit by bit, he is setting you free. And that's uh, my prayer for, uh, for all of us, that bit by bit, moment by moment, the Spirit of God might be setting us free. Amen. <laughs>